So when looking at the cardiorespiratory parameters, temperature, and symptoms that in the control group, there wasn't really any substantial change during the experiment regarding these parameters. However, in the trained individual group that had practiced learning the breathing techniques, when they did so, that resulted in an immediate and profound decrease of carbon dioxide and bicarbonate and an increase in pH, reaching up to 7.75 in individual subjects, indicating acute respiratory alkalosis, which normalized quickly after cessation of the breathing techniques. Now, in terms of the lipopolysaccharide administration, that's the endotoxin, this resulted in a fever with a maximum temperature increase in the control group of 1.9 degrees Celsius, whereas this increase was less pronounced and normalized earlier in the trained group. We see that in this graph here where the uh, temperature of both the trained and control uh, individuals in the study rises during the endotoxemia experiment. However, in the trained individuals, the peak is not as high as in the control group, and it does seem to normalize quite a bit sooner, as you can see here. Now, regarding the subjective scores of the fever-like symptoms, so the, na the nausea, headache, shivering, and muscle and back pain, which was on that six-point scale, they peaked at 1.5 hours after the lipopolysaccharide administration in both groups, but were attenuated in the trained individuals compared to the control group there was about a 56% reduction in peak levels. We see that in this graph labeled J here, where the controlled individuals, the scores that they reported in terms of this, the subjective feelings of discomfort from the endotaxemia experiment are much higher early on in the control group than the trained group. Okay, what about the catecholamine levels? Well, they uh, measured that plasma epinephrine levels increased sharply one hour after lipopolysaccharide administration and peaked at T equals 1.5 hours after administration in the control group. In trained subjects, baseline epinephrine levels were significantly higher compared to the control group. And not only that, but after starting practicing the learned breathing techniques, epinephrine levels further increased in the trained group and peaked just before administration of lipopolysaccharide and they remained elevated until cessation of the breathing techniques. And in contrast to epinephrine, norepinephrine and dopamine levels remained within the reference range throughout the experiment. So really the effect was by the epinephrine and not the other catecholamines. They also showed that there was no difference in blood levels of the stress hormone cortisol between the two groups before or during the period in which the trained group practiced their techniques. However, they did show that the levels normalized more quickly in the trained individuals. So here is epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, dopamine, those are the three types of catecholamines, and then cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And we can see that of the three catecholamines, really only the epinephrine shows a big difference between the control and trained groups where the epinephrine amounts we see are quite a bit higher in the trained group to start out with and they shoot up even higher still uh, compared to the control group. Not a big difference in norepinephrine or, or dopamine and then as was already stated for cortisol it's about the same between the two groups although the trained group does resolve and come back down much quicker than the uh, control group and these are all statistically significant results. All right what about leukocyte counts are they different? So leukocytes are white blood cells Total leukocyte counts in both groups showed the typical endotoxemia-induced biphasic pattern with an initial leukopenia followed by leukocytosis. So leukopenia means a decrease in leukocytes or white blood cells followed by leukocytosis, which means an increase in leukocytes or white, white blood cells. Uh, the authors also say that leukocyte concentrations were markedly higher in trained individuals and 30 minutes after start of breathing techniques, an increase in lymphocytes, which are a type of leukocyte, it's a type of white blood cell, was observed in trained individuals, which was not present in the control group. Furthermore, the concentrations of neutrophils and monocytes, further types of 
uh, leukocytes were similar between groups at the early time point, but were distinctly higher in the trained group at later time points. We can see that in these graphs here. Here is the total leukocyte, so all the white blood cell count. And you can see that leukopenia, the decrease in the first hour, followed by leukocytosis, an increase. And we can see that the train group has markedly higher levels of leukocytes or white blood cells all throughout the experiment. When we look at the particular types of white blood cells, such as lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils, we can see that throughout the different parts of the experiment, there are times where specific white blood cells are increased in number in the train group compared to the control group. So interestingly enough, even though the immune response in terms of feeling the fever-like symptoms is dampened, the actual immune system with the white blood cells that are ready to fight for the body, let's say, or uh, fight against the pathogen, those numbers are actually up and increased. Okay, and lastly, let's look at the plasma cytokines as well. So plasma concentrations are of pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and interleukin-8, and the anti-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-10, all markedly increased after lipopolysaccharide administration in both groups. However, in the trained individuals, the pro-inflammatory ones, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and 8, those levels were significantly attenuated or decreased, whereas the IL-10 the anti-inflammatory one, the IL-10 response was greatly augmented compared with the control group. So the anti-inflammatory response was augmented or increased in the trained group compared to the control group. Furthermore, IL-10 levels in the trained group increased sharply early after lipopolysaccharide administration and peaked one hour before the peak observed in the control group. So here's two ways to represent the same data. One is a time course of the blood concentration of the levels of cytokines. We have TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and 8. Those are the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the ones that would make someone feel fever-like symptoms. And we can see that the control group has significantly higher levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines than the trained group does, both when you plot it in this graph and when you calculate the area under the curve and uh, represent the data with these bar graphs. It's statistically significant for an increase in those pro-inflammatory cytokines for the control group. And then we can see in the train group, there's a much larger increase of the anti-inflammatory or the immune suppressive IL-10. So in addition to the measurements made that I already mentioned, the authors also did a little bit of correlation analysis between the hormones and cytokines that were measured. And so here's what they found. They saw that there was a strong positive correlation between epinephrine levels in the train group at T equals zero. So just at the moment of the exposure to endotoxin and the early increase in interleukin 10, which is the anti-inflammatory cytokine. And uh, they specifically looked at the levels at T equals one, so one hour post exposure, because this was the time point at which the interleukin levels peaked. And they also say that this was not the same association was not present in the control group. Uh, additionally, there were significant inverse correlations between levels of anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 at T equals one hour and peak levels of the pro-inflammatory mediators, TNF-alpha, at T equals 1.5 hours, so one and a half hours post-exposure to endotoxin. This was when TNF-alpha had peaked, and interleukin-6 and 8 at T equals 2 hours, so two hours post-exposure to endotoxin. This was when these cytokines had peaked. So there was an inverse correlation between the levels of the anti-inflammatory IL-10 to the levels of the pro-inflammatory TNF-alpha and IL-6 in the train group. Again, in the control group, there was no such inverse correlation found. Let's take a look at the figure more closely. So here we see that epinephrine levels at the start of the experiment have a high correlation with interleukin levels one hour past exposure to endotoxin. So the higher the epinephrine levels were, the more 
increase of interleukin 10, the anti-inflammatory cytokine, the more there was an increase of uh, release of that uh, cytokine, as you can see in this graph. The lower the amount of epinephrine, the less anti-inflammatory cytokine was released. Now, when you look at the levels of that anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 at one hour compared to the pro-inflammatory cytokine release at one and a half hour for TNF-alpha and two hours at for IL-6 and IL-8, you see that there's an inverse correlation where the higher the number of IL-10, the anti-inflammatory cytokine, the lower the levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF-alpha, as you can see here, as well as the IL-6 on this side and IL-8 over here. And of course, the reverse is true here, where I, when IL-10 is low at the one hour mark post-exposure to endotoxin, we see that the pro-inflammatory markers, TNF-alpha, is high at one and a half hours, and it's also high for the pro-inflammatory markers of IL-6 and IL-8. At the two hour mark, you can see that here as well. Thanks for checking out that video. I hope you liked it. Here are a couple more for you to check out. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to my channel.